Yeah, as Paul uh, said, this project uh, came after uh, the velocity model building technique that we developed using penalized local cross correlations. And in some sense, is a simpler problem because in, uh, in 4D time lapse seismic, uh, even though the position of uh, the shot and the receivers may, ch may vary between the baseline and monitor survey, still the changes are not the same of uh, different shots in, within the same survey for the, in, in the context of migration velocity analysis. So for example, in this case, we have the risk of cycle skipping, as I showed in the previous presentation, because different shots illuminate completely different parts of the model, is uh, um, less less severe, I would say. Anyway, the problem in um, uh, the time lapse velocity analysis um, uh, addresses is that when we produce a reservoir, we modify the stress condition of the subsurface. We in particular, we, uh, if we produce a reservoir, we decrease the pore pressure inside the reservoir and that leads to an increase in uh, effective pressure, which leads to an increase in seismic velocity. There are also other geomechanical, more complicated effects that uh, happen. Uh, you may have subsidence, you may have all sorts of uh, geomechanical related effects, but in, in this presentation, I will assume that subsidence at least is not um, as important as a factor, or at least the, uh, the boundaries, the physical boundaries uh, in the subsurface and the physical boundaries of the reservoir don't move as much compared to the wavelength of the, um, of the seismic signal. Um, so this is a very simple model of a reservoir, and uh, this is what happens when uh, we produce the reservoir. As I said before, P represents pore pressure inside the reservoir, so delta P is the change in pore pressure inside the reservoir, and delta V greater to zero means that because of compaction, because of the compaction induced by the change in pore pressure inside the reservoir, we have an increase in seismic velocity. What this, does, what this cartoon doesn't show you is also the changes that happen outside the reservoir. The compaction inside the reservoir leads to an increase in velocity, but the um, uh, the tensile straight, uh, strain outside the reservoir leads actually to a decrease in velocity outside the reservoir and leads to complicated uh, perturbation patterns that uh, may also in, uh, include anisotropy and changes in the symmetry of the elastic properties of the medium. In this presentation, I assume that uh, the changes that we have are mainly acoustic, so we don't have anisotropy induced. We may have uh, more complicated uh, changes in, uh, in, in, velo in seismic velocity, but there is no induced uh, anisotropy in these examples. These are a couple of uh, examples that are well known in the literature. This is the ECOFISC fi uh, field in the North Sea that because of uh, production underwent, I uh, think about 12 meters subsidence and needed to be jacked up with a considerable cost uh, to perform this operation. And this is what happened in uh, California. These images apparently are not hoaxes. This is true. I mean, the, there was a subsidence up to uh, a couple of meters in California because of uh, uh, groundwater uh, extraction for agricultural purposes. In the context of exploration geophysics, changing the stress properties in the subsurface can reactivate faults that, and uh, the change in stress can actually shear off wells with the cost that you can easily imagine, which we are talking about a lot of money. And also, they represent hazards and risk during operations. And we want to be able to uh, monitor these changes in stress, and we want to actually be able to supply information to the geomechanicists that uh, then model the stress condition in the subsurface and can actually predict what is going to happen. So, reality and imaging are two different things, and with this, in the following slides, I'll show you in what kind of assumptions we, we want to work. So, in reality, we produce a reservoir, we decrease the pore pressure, we increase the seismic velocity. What happens from the imaging point of view? From the imaging point of view, because we are using the uh, velocity model that we extracted from a previous baseline survey, the velocity model will actually appear slower. So 
we will image the interfaces of the reservoir at a different depth. And we want to correct this error in the velocity model in order to match the baseline and the monitor migrated images. Uh, and we want to do this using image domain uh, wave tomography. This is a very simple synthetic example. This is a bunch of uh, stack of horizontal flat layers and two different surveys. Uh, I think you can barely see any change, but there is a, a shift in the, in, the, in the reflectors, especially the, the deeper ones. Uh, this example was designed to uh, test robustness against repeatability. The change in, there is a random perturbation in the position of the source and the receivers for, uh, um, for the two acquisitions, but the change cannot be actually appreciated on, at this scale, but there is actually a change. Uh, the way we analyze the difference between these two images is using penalized local cross correlations. This is essentially the same technique that we introduced uh, last year for migration velocity analysis. The operator P is an operator that is derived from the structural information in the image, the, the deep field, and it depends on uh, the deep field itself and the uh, correlation legs. And uh, the local cross correlations <coughs> are computed uh, using localized, uh, lo localized cross correlation be correlations between the baseline image and the monitor image. To show that this approach is really analogous to the wave, uh, migration velocity analysis case, this is the uh, local cross correlation in uh, local cross correlations in the case of migration velocity analysis. So for time lapse monitor, we have a baseline image and a monitor image. For migration velocity analysis, we have uh, an image obtained from one shot and another image obtained from a different shot. But really, the, the operator is, is the same. The way the penalty operator are computed is very, very simple. It's essentially the dot product between uh, the dip measured at a particular location in space. Uh, this slide is indicated by uh, the Greek letter nu. And the dot product is between this deep, uh, deep vector and uh, the local cross correlation legs. You see that um, this penalty operator defines essentially two areas. Defines uh, if the dot product between these two vectors is um, negative, we are measuring shift in one direction. If the vectors point more or less in the same direction, the dot product is positive and we are measuring shifts in the, in the other direction. If the movement is along the nodal line in, uh, in this panel, then it means that there is actually no shift uh, up or down or relative to the dip of the, of the structure. And in the case of migration velocity analysis, there was a measure of correctness of the velocity model. So this is the model I used for generating the data that I, that I then migrated in, uh, in the previous slides. And uh, this is the perturbation I applied <coughs> Uh, in the monitor um, for the modeling the monitor data set. It's, it's, a, it's a Gaussian, it's very uh, elongated horizontally and it's pretty much constrained in a, in a single layer. And uh, if you pay attention, you see that the anomaly barely touches anything that is above one kilometer. So, actually, just to point out, at one kilometer, there is actually a reflector, which is not that influenced by this anomaly. And, uh, but I want to point out that reflector because I want to show you that we still can observe non-repeatability of the issue, even in this very simple example, directly in the, in the data space. These are, this is the shot gather for uh, the baseline survey. This is the shot gather for the monitor survey. And this is the difference between the two data sets. Because of the difference because, uh, between the shot positions, even if the, some of the reflectors are above the perturbed zone in the, in the model, we still have differences in the data. And these differences come from the fact that the survey is not perfectly repeatable. Still, we will be able to uh, correctly uh, account for uh, um, these differences using uh, localized, uh, ima lo penalized image uh, cross correlations. So again, this is the migrated image for the baseline survey. This is the migrated image for the monitor survey. And I want to describe the procedure 
uh, analyzing the area highlighted by the by the yellow box. So these are the local cross correlations that we can compute in the yellow box. As you can see, these are similar to what they are actually uh, obtained with uh, the code and uh, the procedure that they described in the very first day for computing uh, localized cross correlations. And you see that uh, they show the general feature of a local cross of a cross correlation. They are characterized by a main lobe and then side lobes that decrease away from uh, the central point. The penalty operators are used to uh, pick the shift or to uh, measure the shift of the peak of the cross correlation with respect to the position of the reflectors. So if we have a shift, uh, if the um, local cross correlation peak is shifted upward, we'll pick a different sign that if it's shi shifted downward because the local cross the penalty operator changes sign across the position of the reflector. And this is what we observe when we multiply the local cross-correlation panels with the penalty operator. Now you see that uh, essentially we change the, the mean value of the local cross-correlation panels and we can actually see that there is a shift between the two images. The average value of these panels measure the shift between the two images. Again, this is uh, penalized correlations and the initial correlations. When we stack over the cross-correlation legs, we get our estimate of sh um, shift between the two images. And in this case, you see that the deeper reflector shift uh, is shifted down more than the uh, shallower reflector because, of course, um, experience more the perturbation in the velocity model. If we run uh, wave equation um, velocity analysis or uh, wave tomography using uh, these shifts, this is the anomaly that we recover after about uh, 50 iterations. You see that the anomaly is mainly uh, focused in the area where the actual perturbation is. Of course, there is, um, uh, there are some side, there are some uh, side lobes outside the, the area, but this is due to the fact that we are using a single shot. So, uh, but even though we are using a single shot, we are able to actually constrain the location of the anomaly fairly well. And uh, this is the comparison with the correct perturbation. You see that uh, the algorithm is able to uh, focus uh, the, on the area that is actually affected by the perturbation in the velocity model. And when we compare the initial shifts, with the final shifts estimated from uh, the corrected images after wave field tomography, we see that now these shifts are negligible or much uh, smaller than the initial shifts. We, and this indicates that the two migrated images, the baseline and the monitor image after wave field tomography, are better aligned. So, as I said at the beginning of the presentation, time lapse uh, seismic has a number of issues. Uh, there is uh, issues related to the repeatability of the survey, and repeatability means uh, position of the, sh uh, of the shot, positions of the receivers, repeatability in for uh, the source signature. The, the source signature in the baseline and in the monitor survey may be different. And uh, if you have shifts or uh, rotation in phase between the, 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 the wavelet that you use for imaging, those uh, phase rotations may translate into, transla into uh, artificial shifts in the migrated images, which are not actually uh, physical. In the project uh, report, I actually analyze uh, several of these issues. I in particular analyze sensitivity to phase rotations in the source signature, uh, sensitivity to uh, uh, the positions of source and receivers, and uh, I also analyze uh, the robustness uh, to change to inaccuracies in the baseline velocity model, which is the starting model that we use for uh, wave field tomography. In particular, it turns out that this approach is uh, robust in the sense that what you estimate is the relative shift between the baseline and the monitor image. 
And what you get is the relative error between your, the assumed baseline model and the uh, corrective one. So even in that case, you are able to estimate uh, perturbation in the velocity model. It may be displaced because the, velocity, the baseline velocity model is inaccurate, but still you will be able to uh, uh, highlight a perturbation in the velocity model. In the last part of this presentation, I want to talk about the more complex geomechanical effects that uh, arise in, uh, in this kind of problems. And uh, in order to do this, I will be using a model that uh, Steve Smith, that recently graduated from uh, CWP and is going to join Shell uh, in Houston, used for his own research that dealt with uh, the inversion of time shifts for uh, time-lapse uh, seismic. So the model I will be using is this. This is uh, a density model with a series of uh, horizontal interfaces. And uh, this is the velocity perturbation that uh, is the result of the geomechanical modeling uh, uh, run on uh, a, a rectangular reservoir that is uh, uh, depressurized about 15% of the, the original value. The original background velocity model is homogeneous. And uh, you see that when you uh, depressurize the reservoir, you increase the velocity inside the reservoir, but you also increase, well, you also decrease the velocity outside the reservoir, and this is due to the tensile stress outside the, outside the reservoir. You also see that the changes in velocity on the sides of the reservoir, and uh, in, in real case scenarios, actually, there is induced anisotropy that may tilt the symmetry axis close to the edges of the, of the reservoir, close to the corners. And this is something that uh, other students in CWP, like Steve, for example, and also uh, Rodrigo Fuch, pre, uh, in previous research, uh, stressed and pointed out. So uh, I'm, again, I'm going to consider a single shot. This is the image obtained from uh, uh, a single shot uh, with the uh, source at the magenta dot and receivers along the green line. And these are, this is the monitor image, the image that we obtained using the baseline velocity model, but whose da the data set came from a uh, modeling run with the uh, perturbed velocity model that I showed you before. So when we compute the relative shifts between these two images, we see that most of the reflectors are shifted um, upward, but the shallower reflector, they experience both the positive and negative anomaly in the velocity model. And uh, so you see that the, uh, there is a, a change in sign of the shift for the two shallowest uh, reflectors. After inversion, we are actually able to correct most of the, uh, the, the misalignment between these two images. And this is the estimated perturbation using only a single shot, the shot that I, uh, I'm considering. You see that the inversion is able to pick up the increase in velocity inside the reservoir, is also able to pick the different sign of the perturbation outside the reservoir, and is also able to constrain the lateral extent of the perturbation fairly well. If you compare the estimated perturbation with the actual one, we see that at the edge of the, of the perturbation, we do, we do a fairly good job in uh, constraining the lateral extent of the, of the perturbation itself. Of course, we are not able to recover the entire extent of the perturbation because we are using only a single shot. And uh, in order to avoid also migration smiles, I'm tapering the shot gather in order to have uh, a clean image of the, uh, of the reflectors in the, in the central part of the acquisition. So to conclude, uh, image displacement inversion is possible and uh, is less sensitive to, to the survey repeatability than the data domain because now we are just looking at structural consistency between the migrated images and uh, is a totally shot-based approach in the sense that we are comparing single migrated shots and no, we don't need to uh, consider a huge amount of, uh, or a large number of migrated images in order to um, assess the quality of uh, the baseline model for the uh, monitor survey. Of course, this approach has a lot of limitations. Uh, well, limitations in the sense that uh, 
the correct model should include anisotropy. The anisotropy is induced by the changes in the uh, stresses condition in the subsurface, and uh, our algorithm is now uh, purely acoustic. And uh, um, and I think this is pretty much what I wanted to tell you. So I thank you for your attention. Oh, before I want to acknowledge Jyoti, that was actually very enthusiastic about. Uh, this project much more uh, confident in a possible positive outcome than I was, and I also was to I want to uh, thank Steve that uh, if I the little bit I know about rock physics and time lapse observing is mainly because of him, and uh, now I really want to thank you for your attention and I'd be happy to take any questions.